Boris Johnson was a driving force behind the Brexit campaign and arguably behind the rejection of the Prime Minister's EU deal. Today, he mounted a bulldozer to tell the PM to stop dithering. He said he'd be utterly amazed if she couldn't get the EU to drop the backstop that ensures no checks at the Irish border and that has upset so many MPs. Our deputy political editor, Beth Rigby, reports. Brexiteer rebel Boris Johnson out today dumping fresh dirt on Theresa May's deal. That's not Brexit. That's not democracy. That's a betrayal of the long-term interests of great British companies. And it makes me utterly furious. Offering his boss unsolicited advice about how to resolve the Brexit paralysis, get back to Brussels and negotiate. If we hold our nerve, I believe we can deliver not a pseudo-Brexit, a fake Brexit in which we leave the EU but end up being run by the EU, but the Brexit people voted for. He's also trying to convince workers at the JCB factory in Staffordshire that one plan B they might want to consider is Boris Johnson in number 10. Put the money into the, the NHS, better transport links. We need to build more housing. Mr Johnson, we're in a moment of national crisis and here you are in front of a digger making a naked leadership pitch. Theresa May has won a confidence vote. Why don't you just get behind her and stop undermining her? She has not succeeded, emphatically not succeeded, in getting her deal through Parliament. And as I, as I said just now, uh, it's gone down by 200, a majority of 230. That's unprecedented. It cannot come back. It is, a, it is an X deal. He might say he's not trying to undermine her, but few doubt his motives. There is a power vacuum and a number of different people are keen to fill it. Some say at the worst possible of times. Back in London, Mrs May trying to shore up her position today, holding talks with some in her cabinet. Just got to get into a car. Forget Brexit breakthroughs, the newly Eurosceptic Foreign Secretary struggling to find his ride. Hello there. As other Brexiteers, Chris Graylin and Ian Duncan Smith, went in for an audience too. Well, it was just a very good meeting. As for the Remainers in Cabinet, well, they were nowhere to be seen. Mrs May is still trying to find common ground with Brexiteer rebels, despite the common ground in Parliament being a long way away from where they are. This self-indulgence by a bunch of deluded, hard Brexiteers in the Tory party all jostling for the leadership is not what the country needs at the moment and it's not going to make any difference. I mean, the idea that the hard Brexiteers in the House of Commons could get any deal through uh, the House of Commons along the lines that they want is for the birds. <laughs> The crisis grinding on and the two biggest political parties near breaking point as the lines that once divided our politics are redrawn. What you're seeing in the country uh, is now research suggesting that an increasing number of voters are now identifying as being Remainers or Brexiteers ahead of whether they're Labour or Conservative. There is a change going on out there. Leaving number 10 for her country retreat, but carrying Brexit baggage with her, this will be very much a working weekend. On Monday, the Prime Minister will have to offer MPs a plan B for Brexit. Beth Rigby, Sky News. In Brazil, a group of regional justice ministers want a tax on national infrastructure to be reclassified as terrorism. Gangs have blown up banks, police stations and even bridges in a campaign of violence in response to the government's changes to prison conditions. Well, our chief correspondent Stuart Ramsey reports from northeastern Fortaleza in Brazil. Deep into the favelas, military police patrols are now constantly on the streets of gang-controlled areas they usually keep out of. There is a crackdown here and anyone, indeed everyone, is a suspect. Stop and search teams fan out from the patrol vehicles securing the area. In Brazil, the crime gangs are heavily armed and they are prepared to defend themselves. It's an urban conflict as dangerous as any war. I take it this is a standard operation. Is it very dangerous here? Very dangerous, yeah. Motorcycle teams and multi-vehicle patrols swoop into the dark, narrow streets unannounced. 
The city of Fortaleza is one of the first to experience the determination of the country's new president to fight back against gang violence. I think they're going to move. I think we're on our way again. It's uh, absolutely constant, this. And they're sort of basically sort of crashing into area as quickly as possible. Uh, areas they know are dangerous, and areas where they know there's gang activity. In fact, the whole area is gang controlled. But uh, they go into specific points where they know they either keep weapons or drugs or deal from here. Roadblocks are now common in areas where crime gangs carry out their business. They check the vehicles for weapons and drugs. Local police are now being supported by heavily armed national police, drafted into the city in their hundreds. A clear message that the new government intends to impose itself. And this is why. A campaign of violence against the state, orchestrated by gang leaders furious at a security crackdown in prisons where they're being held. The gangs have blown up bridges, hijacked and destroyed buses, bringing public transport to a standstill. They've hit water and electricity supplies, and in groups attacked a series of garages, setting them alight. The federal police here, yeah. like uh, in, in England, don't have this, this uh, function. You don't see this often. The justice minister packs a gun. Elected to office, he is actually a detective specialising in organised crime and drug trafficking. He's overseen the response here, and he, like many others, want more power. Crime violence, as they've seen, should, he says, be classified as terrorism. So basically what you're saying is it is terrorism, but yeah. because of the law, it isn't prosecuted as such. Yeah. yeah. And if there, you... It's uh, damage to the public. If, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A sort of a different crime. Yeah. And you would like to see that change so that you could actually be stronger. Yeah. All of uh, the... We have a, a college of mm -hmm. the uh, secretary, yes. public security of all states in, uh, is our interest that the, the law uh, we have to be changed. But this president might do it. We expect yes. The truth is imposing law and order in Brazil isn't easy and it will cost a fortune in personnel and resources. Here it's been difficult enough. And in Rio and Sao Paulo, where the gangs are the size of armies, it could be nigh on impossible. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Fortaleza. And there are demands in Washington for an investigation into reports President Trump ordered his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, to lie to Congress about his links with Russia. A report by the BuzzFeed News Service claims the president directed Mr. Cohen to lie about his plans to build a Trump Tower in Moscow before he took office. Mr. Cohen already faces a three-year jail sentence for violating campaign finance laws. Here's our North America editor, John Sopel. The subject that just won't go away the president and Russia, and the most serious allegations to date about his attempts to hide the efforts the Trump organization was making to build a Trump Tower in Moscow just before the election. After Donald Trump became president, his then personal lawyer Michael Cohen went before Congress and said on oath that the plan was scrapped in January 2016. That wasn't true and a lie that earned him time in jail. But according to a detailed BuzzFeed report, the lie wasn't his idea. The special counsel's office learned about Trump's directive for Cohen to lie to Congress through interviews with multiple witnesses from the Trump organization and internal company emails, text messages and a cache of other documents. And the report goes on. The president personally instructed him to lie by claiming that negotiations ended months earlier than they actually did in order to obscure Trump's involvement. The president's current personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, has categorically denied this. The White House has been more circumspect. This is just another in a so long you, line of ridiculous the, charges without any corroboration you, or credibility you're whatsoever. You're saying the president did not tell Michael Cohen to do that? I'm telling you right now, this is exactly why the president refuses uh, to give any credence or credibility to news outlets because they have no uh, ability to corroborate anything they're putting out there. Instead, they're just using innuendo and well, that, shady that sources. A, that was not a denial of my question. 
No, the, the, but, but, but the premise is ridiculous. And the president's press secretary stuck rigidly to quoting Rudy Giuliani's words. Look, that's absolutely ridiculous. I think that the uh, president's outside counsel uh, addressed this best and said in a statement earlier today that's categorically false. The chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, tweeted this. The allegation that the President of the United States may have suborned perjury before our committee in an effort to curtail the investigation and cover up his business dealings with Russia is among the most serious to date. We will do what's necessary to find out if it's true. Suborned perjury? That phrase has been used a couple of times before. It's the charge that brought Richard Nixon down. It's the accusation that led to Bill Clinton too being impeached over lies that he told about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky. The week started with the bizarre spectacle of the president feeling it necessary to come out before the cameras and say that he wasn't working for the Russians. It ends with him facing serious allegations of obstructing justice. The reason this is so significant is that obstruction of justice is considered a high crime and misdemeanor, something that can lead to impeachment. John Sopel, BBC News, Washington. The Prime Minister has spent the day speaking to other European leaders and meeting members of her cabinet to discuss the future of her Brexit plans, which were overwhelmingly rejected by MPs earlier this week. Mrs May is due to present new proposals to Parliament on Monday. Here's our political correspondent, Ben Wright. Mr Gove, are you confident getting the Brexit deal that you want? So what now? Today, the Prime Minister continued to listen, with Cabinet Ministers trooping in and out to share their advice with the Prime Minister, who has a Brexit deal the House of Commons hates and the EU insists cannot be changed. Just got to get into a car. Tight-lipped. But for Brexiteers, some red lines on trade must stay. Well, I don't believe we could have an independent trade policy if we stayed in a customs union. And the reason for that is, in a customs union, uh, with the European Union, we would have to apply European trade law without having a say in how it's made. He's happy to sign agreements with Australia, but he won't sign up to a customs union compromise that might lead to cross-party support in Parliament for a new deal. But if there is no deal, there are no trade agreements nailed down with 40 major economies to replace the existing ones we have as members of the EU. Liam Fox said other countries needed to put more work in. While some in Theresa May's divided cabinet are telling her that leaving the European Union without a deal would be OK, others, particularly a camp dubbed the Gang of Five, are urging the Prime Minister to find a cross-party solution to this crisis, to compromise and to rule out what they think would be the disaster of a no-deal Brexit. And of course there's very little time left. On Monday, the Prime Minister will make a statement in the Commons setting out the government's Plan B, and MPs will start to put forward their alternative ideas as amendments to that motion. The following Tuesday, we'll then see a series of crunch votes on all of that. And as things stand, exactly two months later, the UK is set to leave the EU, whether Parliament has agreed a Brexit deal or not. Touring a Brexit-supporting business, Boris Johnson dug himself into a hole after claiming he had not warned about imminent Turkish EU membership during the referendum. He did. But the former Foreign Secretary was here to tell the Prime Minister to fundamentally renegotiate her deal with the EU and under no circumstances to delay the UK's departure. I'm telling the British public, after all this hoo-ha, that we've abandoned the project of, of leaving the European Union would be so utterly pathetic it would reinforce people's view that there's some kind of plot going on at Westminster uh, to stop this thing. Here, competing ideas to break the political paralysis are being argued over, and many MPs do see the merits in asking for some more time. If um, we need further ne negotiation and Article 50 is extended for a few months, let's say till the summer, then I don't have a problem, or, or a few months, or, and I don't think the public are fairly reasonable on this, um, wouldn't have a problem either. Before leaving Downing Street for a working weekend, Theresa May spoke to EU leaders, but her headache is here, trapped between the demands of her divided party and a fractured parliament. 
Now, as the Prime Minister attempts to grapple behind the scenes to find a way forward on Brexit, Boris Johnson burst into public before the cameras today to criticise her efforts. Judged by many to be another barely concealed bid for leadership, he said she should simply go back to Brussels and tell them to drop the controversial backstop for Northern Ireland. But he was quickly admired in a controversy of his own about claims he'd made during the original Brexit campaign. While Theresa May was taking soundings in London about what to do next over Brexit, <laughs> Boris Johnson was making a noisy intervention of his own. No longer Foreign Secretary, but still a VIP at JCB's headquarters, he had this advice for the Prime Minister. If we spend the next few weeks hydraulically straining to move MPs from one camp to the other, or pointlessly trying to get Mr Corbyn to come and parley, at number 10, we'll be wasting our time. His solution, demand Brussels dump the backstop. We haven't even tried to get rid of it. We haven't even asked. Mr Johnson, you're standing in front of a giant digger. Yeah. Wouldn't it be more appropriate if you're standing in front of a giant unicorn, suggesting that simply I'm... going back to Brussels and saying, get rid of the backstop, they are going to move on this. And isn't it a bit rich suggesting that Theresa May hasn't even tried to negotiate with Brussels when you abandoned the field of play when you resigned as well? Well, 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 fair question. Um, I think I tried to answer it in my, in my speech. Actually, uh, this is the moment. And I don't think we've gone in with sufficient drive and JCB-style gumption to, to, to get this. Today, in what looked like a rebranding exercise, he also said he was pro-immigration. How did that sit, he was asked, with his claims during the referendum that millions of Turks would come to Britain if we stayed in the EU. I didn't say anything about Turkey. I didn't make any remarks about Turkey. Didn't say anything. A brief glance at the record, this letter to David Cameron, for example, suggests otherwise. But what of his claims that Mrs May, who headed to Chequers this afternoon, would get nowhere with cross-party talks? One former minister thinks he's right. I fear that the talks are doomed to failure because the Prime Minister is highly constrained. She's got irreconcilable demands on her in the Conservative Party, but also the Prime Minister is very wedded to her own deal. But the reality is her deal was sunk this week by a massive majority and she only has until Monday to come up with Plan B. And Libby joins me here in the studio. So let's talk about the Plan B on Monday. How is that all going to unfold? Just take us through it. Well, Boris Johnson today described the Prime Minister's deal as deceased. And you would think after that crushing defeat on Tuesday that, in fact, it was dead. But all the signs are, despite all the talking that's been going on in Westminster in the last 48 hours, all the signs are that her plan B that she presents to the House of Commons on Monday will look incredibly like plan A, perhaps only in different coloured ink. The reason being is that she's walking a political tightrope. Uh, some of her cabinet are uh, apparently threatening to walk if she uh, says that she won't uh, consider taking no deal off the table. Others saying they'll walk if she embraces Labour's idea of uh, staying in a permanent customs union. I think what might unlock the situation is this backbench amendment put forward by Jack Dromey from the Labour Party, Caroline Spellman from the Conservatives, which is demanding that the government take no deal off the table. How could they do that in practice? Well, perhaps extend Article 50. We won't know whether that is going to happen at all until the week after next because the actual vote won't be till Tuesday the 29th. So yet another crunch day on the way on Monday, Absolutely. Libby. Thank you very much indeed for that. And we can join Robert now in Washington. And understandably, Robert, a lot of attention focused on that shutdown. But there's another big story really gathering pace now about the allegations of links between President Trump and the Russians. That's right, Julie. I mean, Michael Cohen is one of the pivotal figures in the Russia investigation. Remember, uh, Cohen is Trump's former lawyer, former fixer, often regarded as the keeper of the Trump family secrets, and he is cooperating uh, fully with the Mueller probe. Now, over the last 24 hours, there has been a news report circulating here 
that Trump instructed Cohen in 2017 to go here to Capitol Hill and lie to Congress about the extent of Trump's negotiations with Moscow about the construction of a skyscraper in the Russian capital. Now, if that is confirmed, that will have Democrats salivating because it would be the clearest evidence so far of an obstruction of justice. In fact, one member uh, of the House has already said that it should lead either to Trump's resignation or to impeachment proceedings. Now, it must be said, Julie, that the president's making clear that, in his view, Cohen is now lying again in order to reduce his jail time. Uh, the president's uh, current lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, is saying it's simply evidence of Cohen's desperation and malice. But certainly, you get the sense here there's now something of a pincer movement on the White House. The Mueller investigation on one side and House Democrats on the other wanting to accelerate their investigations. Okay, Robert, thank you very much indeed for that.